London locks in Lake Washington Ship Canal opened 100 years ago. They brought a lot of change to Seattle. I'm Katie McGilvery and I work for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. We built the locks in the canal and we still run them today. For our centennial, we decided to team up with local organizations to make a series of short films. As we look back at the impact of the locks in the canal, it's clear that the Native Americans are an important part of our history. For decades, the core Seattle district has been working closely with local tribes to uphold Native American treaty rights. The following film tells that story. Salmon Bay Charlie was a native of the Salmon Bay area before it was transformed and altered by the construction of the Ballard Locks. This photo of Salmon Bay Charlie being evicted from his ancient home to make way for the Ship Canal is unfortunately in American history not an uncommon event or image where the relationship between the native people and the landscape and the natural resources were being ignored. I see that he's somewhat defiant, but also probably a little confused by the fact that he has to stand alone against this. And, but uh, I know that he shows a lot of uh, honor and pride, though, in the fact that he's uh, continued to live in a place that um, he, his, his people have been in for centuries. When the ship canal went in, it had a rippling effect in our culture and to our people. But the traditional roots of our people uh, still exist here in the Salmon Bay area through our rights to gather, to harvest, our right to feed our children, our right to feed our grandchildren, these traditional foods. Today, we work with the state of Washington, we work with Suquamish and U.S. Army Corps of Engineers co-managing the fisheries program that occurs here in Lake Washington, Salmon Bay, and the Ballard Locks, and exercise our treaty right by harvesting fish. You can look at treaty rights as the glass that's half full, or you can look at it as the glass that's half empty. I prefer to think the glass is half full. Two hundred years ago, the Puget Sound was a lot different than it is today. There were much larger ancient trees here. Glaciers and uh, snowpacks were hardy. We had cleaner water, much cleaner water, much more stronger river and stream flows, and uh, there was a lot more wildlife here. The tribes were very well adapted to this environment. Uh, we're able to gather and store large quantities of salmon and clams and berries and deer and all the foods that they needed. And they also had quite a bit of access to medicinal plants and also materials for building homes and making clothing and for their use in their technology, their fishing nets and their canoe paddles and all those great things that they needed to adapt and survive in the, in the Puget Sound. Salmon were the basis of our subsistence and were also important because of their spiritual connection to the tribe. Most of the tribes here believe that the salmon are people and that the salmon transform themselves every year uh, into their salmon form to provide food for the people. So it's important that we take care of the habitat, that we use the fish in an honorable way and we share it and just take what we need and then save a lot to be uh, restored in the spawning beds so that they can go back to their winter houses and conduct their ceremonies and come back again and when they turn themselves back into the fish that we have always relied upon. Salmon Bay was such a productive environment that people returned to that area seasonally, year after year, to hunt and to fish and to collect shellfish. And we know from archaeological sites in the area that there were villages there. There were a group of people called the Shilshol that lived there. And Salmon Bay Charlie was probably one of the last Indian people that were living in that area. 
There were a number of Coast Salish groups that used the area that we know of as the Ship Canal for moving people and goods between freshwater and saltwater. It's a cleft in the hills that would be an obvious route. There's two small strips of land that are blocking the way, but if you're using canoes, it's easy to portage over those areas or to have other canoes waiting for you um, stored on either side of the portages. You would see Lake Washington on the inland side as having a wealth of resources. You can go there to fish, you can go there to get cattail that you need to create mats or to weave into baskets. But then there's also the social aspect of it where they want to maybe visit relatives that live up in the Snoqualmie River. So you would have people traveling um, via the area we know as the Ship Canal in order to go to different places around the region. And you think about it, it's a, the Ship Canal today is just a new iteration of something that's been happening for thousands of years. After the Denny party landed on Alki Beach, there were a lot of changes. And one of the changes was that the traditional villages of this area needed to make room for the European neighbors that were coming in. Our European neighbors discovered how bountiful this area was and really wanted to exploit those resources, timber, land, and fish. Unfortunately, my ancestors were on the receiving end of those changes. They had to literally pack up their belongings and move to a reservation. And these reservations are a result of the Point Elliott Treaty, basically an agreement between the governments that says we're going to relocate from our traditional village sites and move to an area that's been designated as a reservation by the federal government. But on the flip side, the treaty also reserved the traditional rights of these people to have access to the natural resources, meaning the fish and the berries, the game, the waterfowl, the beach. These tribes still had reserved their rights to feed their children, to feed themselves, to feed their elders. One of the impacts of the Ship Canal, of the Ballard Locks, was the lowering of Lake Washington, nine feet which had a huge impact on the south end of the lake and its natural resources, which affected my people and their treaty right to harvest natural resources. So lowering of the lake was significant enough to literally destroy a river. The Black River simply just went away. There is remnants of it still there in Tukwila. There's a ditch there and it's sad because that was really a real special place. The village there was wonderful, how generous Mother Nature was in that vicinity. To have a fish weir there, and knowing that one species of salmon is, is coming, and then you wait maybe a month or so, and another species will come in. But unfortunately, in 1916, between the months of August and October, the Black River went away, and the impact must have been incredible. Joseph Moses lived in that village there on the Black River. And this is a quote from him. Uh, that was quite a day for the white people, at least. The water just went down, down, until our landing and canoes stood dry. And there was no Black River at all. There were pools, of course, and the struggling fish trapped in them. People came from miles around laughing and hollering and stuffing the fish in gunny sacks. Joseph Moses, member of the Duwamish and one of the last to live on the tribe's historic land in downtown Renton. The fishing rights case that developed in the 1970s grew out of the fact that tribal people were not being allowed to fish as they had been promised. It was a time when traditional culture had been disappearing and tribal fishermen had not been able to get their share of the catch. And so they fought for their fishing rights, the rights that they'd been guaranteed in the treaties. That was kind of the buck stops here moment where we're gonna fight for salmon and it's gonna help our culture and that's what's happened. And since that time then, tribal culture has had a resurgence as well. And so now I think the tribes have realized their treaty rights, but also their rights to practice their traditional culture. 
And so they're working with the Army Corps and other groups to make sure that they're a partner in this big enterprise that's, that's pretty amazing. When people see a fishery being conducted in the Bower Locks by the tribe, I think their first feeling is there's an issue with overfishing. And that's not true because there's a robust and strong management system that's negotiated by the state and the tribes and the United States federal government to manage our fisheries in a way that provide enough escapement of salmon so that they can reproduce and come back and provide uh, sustainable fisheries. There's a commercial fishery which provides income to our fishermen. We also have fishermen that go out and fish on a ceremonial basis for the tribe so that we have traditional food for our ceremonies, including memorials and funerals and hosting canoe journeys and for different events within the tribal community. We believe that it's only fair that we be engaged in the fishery that was rightfully ours, that we exchanged for ownership of the land. It's important for us to honor what our ancestors were able to allow us to continue. When representatives from our area went to the Point Elliot Treaty meeting and put their X on the paper. I prefer to think that our leadership in the 1850s knew what was coming and in an effort to salvage what they could, not only for them, but for their future, for their children, their children's children. They needed to put some key phrases and some key words in that little piece of paper that would provide us an opportunity to be Indian in the 20th century, in the 21st century. Mm -hmm.